Okay, the last uh, discussion of meta reinforcement learning will be about how meta RL can actually be framed as a partially observed MTP. And some of you might have already guessed this from my discussion about how you can do meta learning simply by conditioning the policy on a history. Uh, but this actually illustrates some interesting connections that will give us a, a better way to unify the different meta RL methods that we've talked about. So a partially observed MDP, just to remind everybody, is an MDP that has observations and observation probabilities in addition to states and actions. So it has an observation space uh, and an emission probability, which is the probability of observing a particular observation given a state. And this is the graphical model for a partially observed MDP from before. In a partially observed MDP, the policy has to act on observations, which typically requires either explicit state estimation, meaning some function that will estimate P of ST given a history of observations, or policies with memory. So let's say that we have a policy, pi theta A given S comma Z, where Z is some variable that encapsulates the information that the policy needs to solve the current task. Learning a task at this point amounts to inferring what Z is. So, so rewinding back to contextual policies, Z might represent something like, oh, it's time to do the laundry, it's time to do the dishes. If you can figure out what you're supposed to be doing, then you will be able to do it successfully, and figuring it out amounts to inferring Z. And in meta-learning, you have to infer this from context. And context is a sequence of transitions, the experience you, that you've gathered in the new MDP MI. This is really just a partially observed Markov decision process. So you have some kind of Z, you don't know what it is, you need to figure out what it is, and you need to figure it out from a sequence of observations, and once you've figured it out, then you can do the task. So before you had an MDP with state S actions A and transition probability and so on, and now you have a modified partially observed MDP M tilde with a modified state space S tilde, observation space O tilde, and transitions P tilde, where the modified state space consists of the original state and Z. So knowing the state means knowing S and knowing Z. But of course you don't observe Z, what you observe is just S, uh, as well as the reward in general. So the key idea is that solving this PUMDP M tilde is equivalent to meta learning. Because if you can get a very high, high reward in this partial observed Markov decision process where the state is observed but the task isn't, then you will be able to solve a new task just from the observations of the state. And, and the reward in general. By the way, the reason that I uh, omit that I kind of gloss over the, the fact that the reward is observed is because you can always concatenate the reward uh, to the state. Now, typically this requires, as I said before, either explicit state estimation, meaning the ability to estimate P of ST given a sequence of observations, or policies with memory. Now, policies with memory, that, that is essentially the RNN meta learners that we talked about before. So those could be viewed just as well uh, uh, as just methods for solving PUMDPs where the task is unknown and it's supposed to be inferred from memory. But let's talk about the other category of PUMDP solvers, ones that perform explicit state estimation. It turns out that this will also lead to a class of uh, meta learning algorithms with some interesting properties. So these meta learning algorithms will aim to directly estimate P of ZT given a history of states, a history of actions, and a history of rewards. Now, in reality, you don't know what Z is. Z is some kind of latent variable. So we're going to train in a similar uh, way as we trained latent variable models from before, uh, where we're going to use variational inference to acquire a learned representation of tasks. And then once we've acquired it, then we can explore via posterior sampling with this latent context. So if you remember the discussion of posterior sampling from the exploration lecture, it amounts to sampling from our posterior belief and then actingly, acting optimally under that belief. So the way that we'll sample is we will actually randomly select a Z from our posterior and then we'll act according to that Z. And that makes a lot of sense because initially you don't know what the task is, so you'll start off by basically trying to do random tasks and as you gather more information, you will zero in on the right task to do. So the procedure will be to sample Z from your belief about Z, given your history, uh, and that will use some approximate posterior trained with variational inference, then act according to pi theta A given S comma Z to collect more data, uh, basically act as though Z was correct, and then repeat this process. And meta training will consist of training pi theta 
and training your variational approximation to the state estimator. Now, this is not an optimal procedure, meaning this is not the best you could do for exploration. Take a moment to think about why. If it's not clear yet, it might become more obvious once I give an example later. Uh, but it is pretty good, uh, both in theory and in practice. So we know that posterior sampling is a good exploration strategy. It turns out that in metal learning, it's not necessarily optimal. And I'll, I'll explain why shortly. Um, but first, let's talk about an example of such a method, and that'll let us instantiate this a little bit more concretely. So there are a variety of techniques that have been proposed that build on this idea. The one I'm going to talk about today is called Perl. Uh, and Perl trains a policy that is conditioned on the state and Z, and it trains an inference network that predicts Z based on a history of states, actions, and rewards. The whole thing is trained with variational inference, very similar uh, to the kind of variational inference that we talked about before. So basically we uh, maximize the expected value of the reward in expectation under the trajectory distribution and the distribution of Zs inferred by the encoder. And we, of course, minimize the KL divergence between Q of Z and the prior. So that just en encourages the Zs to contain minimal information, just like in a variational autoencoder. And the goal is to really maximize the post-update reward, meaning the reward after you've inferred the Z. This is the same as standard meta-reinforcement learning, while at the same time staying close to the prior. So it's conceptually actually very similar to RNN-based meta-RL, in that you read in a history, you predict some kind of statistic, you give that statistic to your policy, and you maximize the reward of the policy that has been given that statistic. The difference is that your encoder now is stochastic, and it infers this latent Z, and you can explore by sampling it from your encoder. So stochastic Z enables exploration via posterior sampling. So here's an illustration of this process, and uh, this will also hopefully make it clearer to you why it, it's a little bit suboptimal. So here we have a, a little 2D point mass. The goal always lies in that semicircle. The blue circle represents the true goal for this task, which the agent doesn't know at the beginning. And you can see that the way that the agent explores is by going to random places on the semicircle, and then once it hits the regions that have high reward, then it keeps going there again and again. So this works pretty well, uh, but hopefully this also makes it clear why this is a little bit suboptimal, because of course, in reality, it might be more optimal for the agent to sweep along that circle in a single episode to find where the reward is, and then revisit the reward again and again. And that would, of course, work better. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, the procedure. Uh, one of the choices that we have to make to instantiate this is we have to actually choose a design for the encoder. This could be done with a recurrent neural network, but it turns out that a very simple encoder uh, actually works really well here. So one really simple encoder simply takes all the transitions, the states, actions, next states, and rewards, featureizes them with some featureizer, uh, and then actually just averages together the features. And it's, it should be enough to do this because the transitions are, uh, you know, can actually be treated as independent. If you think of something like a Q-learning algorithm, the Q-learning algorithm doesn't care about the ordering of the transitions, so it makes sense that your encoder here shouldn't care about it either. Uh, and that's actually a really simple way to do this. Uh, so you average together the features, and then you use that to pr produce the mean and the variance of the Z posterior. The meta-training here is done with an off-policy actor critic algorithm, so like a soft actor critic, which goes pretty well with the variational inference uh, procedure. And uh, the only difference is that every time you make an update, you have to also update the encoder, which you do by loading uh, some transitions from the buffer, as, as well as their histories, and those histories are used to train the encoder. So in that sense, it is actually very similar to the RNN-based meta learner. Okay, if you want to learn more about this, uh, here are a few papers that you could check out that take some version of this PUMDP view on the meta learning problem, uh, and uh, they would go into this in more detail if you want to uh, get the technical specifics. But one of the things I want to end on is to discuss how the three perspectives of meta, meta RL that we talked about all kind of fit together. So. In all of the meta-RL methods we talked about, they can be represented as some kind of F theta that takes in an MDP MI, and in reality what that means is that it takes in experience in this MDP, and it needs to be able to improve from that experience and be able to choose actions that explore effectively. The first perspective we talked about is just a black box model, like an RNN, that can read in the entirety of that experience. Then we talked about framing it as this gradient-based meta-learning procedure, 
And then we talked about how we could also frame it as an inference problem, as a problem of inferring some context z that is sufficient to figure out the task. These things are not that different. Uh, the RNN is conceptually very simple. It's relatively easy to apply, but it's very vulnerable to what is sometimes called meta-overfitting, meaning that uh, if the uh, task at test time is a little bit outside of the distribution of training tasks, the RNN might not produce a very good H, and there's sort of no recourse past that. Like you run the RNN forward, it does what it does, and you can't improve it further on the test task. RNNs can also be challenging to optimize in practice, although more recent sequence models like transformers can make this a bit easier. Uh, the gradient-based approach has good extrapolation in the sense that you can just keep running more gradient steps at test time and eventually you'll get better. And it's conceptually elegant, but it can be complicated and can require many meta-training samples. It's also very difficult to extend these methods from policy gradients to things like actor critic methods because as we've talked about before, temporal difference learning is not really gradient descent, so it's very hard to apply gradient-based meta-learning to. The inference approach is simple. Uh, and provides for effective exploration via posterior sampling, and has an elegant reduction to solving a special kind of pump DP, but like the RNN approach, it can be vulnerable to meta-overfitting. Uh, and it can be a, a bit challenging to optimize in practice. But let's talk about how these things are actually similar to each other. The inference procedure is really just like the RNN procedure, but with stochastic variables. So phi is basically z. And the gradient-based approach can be instantiated as one of the other two, just with a particular choice of architecture. In fact, you can actually develop a stochastic version of model agnostic metal learning by adding noise to your gradients, and that will start looking a lot like the inference process. So they're actually pretty similar. The last thing I want to leave you off with is um, a few points about interesting observations on meta RL in the literature. So, so far I talked a lot about methodology, but the other thing that people have studied a lot is how meta-reinforcement learning can lead to interesting emergent phenomena. And this often falls at the intersections of reinforcement learning and cognitive science. So um, the observation goes something like this. Humans and animals seemingly learn behaviors in a variety of ways, including highly efficient, uh, but apparently model-free RL, episodic recall, where they uh, recall things that worked before and immediately do them, and model-based RL. And when people study uh, learning in, in human and animal brains, it seems like all these things are occurring at some point, and it's not clear how the brain decides whether to do one or the other, or whether it has different algorithms running. Um, so one hypothesis is that maybe each of these things are kind of emergent uh, properties of some overarching method that can learn how to learn. And people have studied how meta-learning can sort of lead to emergent learning processes that are different than the ones that were used for meta-learning in the first place. So there are papers that have analyzed how meta-RL can give rise to episodic learning, where you recall related episodes of experience, how model-free meta-RL can give rise to model-based adaptation, and even how meta-RL can give rise to something that looks like causal reasoning. So again, I won't go into great detail about each of these things, but if you want to learn more about them, I would encourage you to check out these papers.